Welcome to this video from a collaboratory of 23 synergy circles of the evolutionary leaders. Initiated just this year, 2023, for the evolutionary leaders and its 23 areas of activist engagement and centering on issues of the divine feminine, divine child, and women's and children's issues around the world. I'm Dr. Kurt Johnson, coordinator of the Synergy Circles, and I'll be joined in these initial videos by collaboratory founders and prominent leaders and activists, Denise Scotto, JD, Laura George, JD, and Dr. Jude Kuravan, along with Rian Eisler, JD, renowned author on these global issues. All of them working together along with others on this emerging activist collaboratory of the Evolutionary Leaders Circle, a project of the Source of Synergy Foundation. In these initial discussions, they will lay out much of the landscape for these important areas of global engagement based on Dr. Eisler's famous four cornerstones of how our world can move from dominance consciousness and dominance cultures to partnership consciousness and partnership cultures. In each video, we'll begin by introducing Dr. Eisler and the Four Cornerstones, and then the featured guest for the episode. Rian Eisler, JD, PhD, is a best selling author, system scientist, futurist, cultural historian, and attorney whose work shows how to build a more equitable, sustainable, and less violent world. Her famous book, The Chalice and the Blade, Our History, Our Future, is now in 57 US printings and 30 foreign editions. Dr. Eisler is president of the Center for Partnership Systems, CPS, and editor-in-chief of the Interdisciplinary Journal of Partnership Studies at the University of Minnesota. She is also the author of Nurturing Our Humanity, How Domination and Partnership Structure Our Brains, Lives, and Future, co-authored with anthropologist Dr. Douglas Fry, Oxford University Press, 2019, and The Real Wealth of Nations, Creating a Caring Economics, hailed by Nobel Peace Laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu as the template for the better world that we are so urgently seeking. In short, according to dictionaries, a domination hierarchy is a social hierarchy arising when interaction of members of a social system creates a ranking system. Such rankings of who are favored can involve gender, race, economic status, and so on. Dr. Eisler's four cornerstones of how we shift from domination consciousness to partnership consciousness are these. And we invite you to hear our first video with Dr. Eisler in which she elaborates these four elements. The first cornerstone is childhood. The second cornerstone is the attitude toward gender. The third cornerstone is economics. And the fourth cornerstone is story and language. So let's go over now to introduce our guest for this episode. The guest for this discussion is Dr. Jude Kuravan. Dr. Kuravan is a cosmologist, futurist, author, and evolutionary leader circle member, previously a senior UK-based international businesswoman. She has a master's degree in physics from Oxford University, specializing in cosmology and quantum physics, and a PhD from the University of Reading, UK, in archaeology, researching ancient cosmologies. Having traveled to over 80 countries and worked with wisdom keepers from many traditions, she is a lifelong researcher into the nature of reality and the author of seven influential books, including the award-winning and best-selling Cosmic Hologram, 2017, and The Story of Gaia, 
2022. 2017, she co-founded the whole world view to serve the understanding, experiencing, and embodying of a unitive awareness, conscious evolution, and transformational change underpinned by a unitive narrative. She is a faculty member at Ubiquity University, Humanities Team, and the California Institute of Integral Studies. And in 2022, she was awarded the Meshworker of the Year Award by Integral Cities. She is also a co-founder of the SDG Thought Leader Circle and the Unitive NGO Thematic Cluster at the United Nations. So over now to Rian Eisler and Jude Curavan. Well, welcome to Dr. Jude Curavan and Dr. Rian Eisler, who we've just told you so much about. In this discussion, we'll be exploring aspects of Dr. Eisler's four cornerstones. We'll be asking Dr. Kuravan to describe recent developments and breakthroughs which affect the landscape of this work that Dr. Eisler is so famous for. And then asking Dr. Eisler to respond so the two of them can then discuss it all further together. So we're actually going to start with cornerstone four, which is story and language. So Jude, as a renowned cosmologist, Tell us what recent developments and breakthroughs in science are creating major new contexts in which we can understand the implications of the cosmic story and how it affects and supports the relevance of Rian's Four Cornerstone. Well, firstly, I just want to thank Rian for your Four Cornerstones because they really are fundamental. They are the ashlars of the, the, the sacred building we hope to, to co-create together, it seems to me. And so, yes, the, the fourth cornerstone for me is where I begin, because as a cosmologist, I've been curious about the nature of reality all my life. And the story that we've been told as children and as societies is actually based on an, a, an old paradigm of materiality and separation. And it's described a universe of, of, of meaninglessness, essentially, of randomness, um, and where mind and consciousness somehow emerge after a very long time of its evolutionary arc from simplicity to complexity. What leading edge science is now doing is turning that entirely on its head. Um, instead, it's revealing with evidence at all scales of existence and across numerous fields of research that instead our universe meaningfully exists and purposefully evolves from simplicity to ever greater levels of complexity and individuated self-awareness and recognition of its interbelonging, interconnectedness and interbeing. And so the, the new story is one that I feel is much more empowering and inspiring and offers us authentic hope for the future because if we see through the lens of separation we behave in ways of separation if we see through this lens of, of unity and unity and diversity and with its unitive narrative then I would hope that we would behave very differently and you know what we're realizing and this is why it's so important I think this is why it's a game changer Kurt and Rianne is because it's evidence-based and we also now have its framing as the appearance of our universe emerging from deeper realms of intelligence and causation. So that imbues everything with this perspective. But perhaps most fundamentally, it's showing us that mind and consciousness aren't something we have, but literally what we and the whole world are. And therefore, it invites, as it seems to me, the universe, it seems to me, is inviting us to literally remember and realize that we are its microcosmic co-creators and we can wake up and consciously evolve to become its co-evolutionary partners. And of course, as, as you both so well know, this understanding is converging with universal wisdom teachings, with indigenous teachings, with spirituality-based teachings, with the tenets of interspirituality that you know so well, Kurt. And so it, it's bringing this all together in this confluence of awareness and this invitation of our potential, 
of what it can mean at this incredible existential moment for our collective choices. Well, I want to tell you, first of all, that I am somewhat in awe of you as a cosmologist, because I this is an area that um, I am really not an expert in at all. What I love about it, uh, Jude, is that it's a story that is congruent with what we know from neuroscience about human evolution that contrary to the old story uh, that we are bad, we, you know, whether it's selfish genes, whether it's original sin, it doesn't matter why they fight each other is beyond me because it's the same story, isn't it? We're exactly. bad. We have to be controlled from the top down, you know, as in God fearing. And that's it. Well, that is a false story. Of course, we have the potential for what we call evil. But we know from neuroscience that these so-called pleasure centers of our brains, they light up more when we share and care than when we win and dominate. And I think that um, all things being equal, which they are not, I mean, if we orient to a domination rather than to the partnership side of the partnership domination social scale, uh, we're constantly being rewarded for the wrong behaviors, whether it's economically, whether it is in families, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, we have that potential. And I love how that is really congruent my latest book, as you may know, is called Nurturing Our Humanity, and the subtitle is How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives, and Future. And I think that uh, human agency is very, very important at this point, but a human agency that is really not traumatized and I'm afraid that domination systems, starting in families, and we can get to that, are really trauma factories. And we see that struggle between the partnership and the domination configuration coming to a head now uh, in our world. It's very visible. And we do need this new paradigm for what are human possibilities. And I totally agree, Rianne. And you know, I think what you're talking about, I would describe as the dis-ease of separation. Absolutely, because the uh, domination paradigm has to be one of in-group versus out-group separation. Uh, how else do you maintain, if not by abuse, by violence, uh, these rankings of top-down domination, be it man over man, man over woman, race over race, religion over religion, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas the more you move, I mean, it's never a perfect world, I don't think. Uh, somehow humans uh, lose it sometimes, but at least it's not built into the system, these rankings of domination, um, whereas in domination systems, we really don't have much choice, do we? Exactly. And, you know, I talk about uh, the evidence now showing us indubitably that separation is an illusion. The unity of our universe expresses itself in radical diversity and differentiation, but we literally are inseparable from it. And so in that regard, it, it seems to me that even when we can move um, to a perspective of unity and diversity and unity and inclusion, I would love us to go a step further to a realization that we belong. We belong to our, in, our universe, our planetary home, each other. We don't need to be invited in because there is no separation. Well, I am very interested in the fact that the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded 
for findings about non-locality and intertwining and interconnection. But that um, doesn't fit into the old paradigm. No, no, but it is the new paradigm. And it's based on the evidence. That's why the Nobel was so crucial, Rianne, because as you know, it's it's only given for set for settled science. It's not given for anything that's contentious or, or not proven. So the fact that it was given, as you say, last year to three researchers who've been working on universal non-locality for decades, I think is, is so significant. Um, well, it's a whole new world. And of course, this lack of separation, this interconnection and the choices we have uh, is really, uh, I think, what uh, we're all working for in different areas. My work is right here in terms of what are the crucial foundations. Uh, we all have to, I mean, the movement towards partnership is actually going on, but it's going on in very separate ways. And this is a frame that we so need in Excellent. order to work together. Yeah, so isn't it fascinating then that we gather here on these topics for this series of three videos, realizing that the current science at the level of cosmology draws the same conclusions and ethical implications as your own work has, uh, Rian. So let's move on then to talk then about cornerstone two, which is gender. And so Jude, what are the contexts within the new understandings of cosmology that would give us an enhanced outlook and understanding of gender. Thank you. And, and Rianne, just to continue, just to complete that initial thought, of course, what this has also enabled us to do, and, and Kurt and I have been very involved with this, is to articulate a unitive narrative. Yes. A unitive narrative that can, then can underpin and frame unitive action for transformation. But in terms of the, yes, in terms of the gender, um, I mean, if we look on a cosmological scale uh, and also in terms of, of ancient wisdom, the I Ching talks about in the beginning is the one, the one becomes two, the two becomes three, and from the three, 10,000 things are born. So there's an inherent differentiation of the one to two to three and then beyond, uh, both cosmologically and in, in wisdom teachings. And we find that, of course, we find, you know, we describe atoms as having protons and neutrons and electrons. There's the active principle, there's the, the receptive principle, and then there's a neutral principle. And we find that at all scales of existence, again, and across many different fields of research, but also prim primarily perceiving the reality of our universe is such that mind and consciousness aren't what we have, they're literally what we in the whole world are, then that differentiation has over 13.8 billion years progressively evolved into individuated self-awareness and then into, you know, certainly on our planetary home, into gender-based individuation. But the ancient Vedic tradition that I'm a great student of no, I'm not a great student. I'm a great, I'm a student of its great wisdom. <laughs> I'm a very lowly student of its great wisdom. Is, is that this sort of aspect of gender, that all the passive, the, the, the active, the passive, uh, not sorry, the active, the responsive, and the neutral aspects are within each and every one of us. So that would say the aspects of the divine feminine, the divine fem, uh, masculine, and the divine child, the Ida, the Pingala, the Shishumna with each and every one of us so in much of my work which has been involved with healing trauma which has been involved with sort of um conscious transformational approaches it's bringing those attributes of the masculine and the feminine together and in doing so the the the, the potential for the birthing of what i refer to as the divine child its co-creativity its wonder its evolutionary potential so I think rather like you, I have not tended to, to feel my work and what's mine to do specifically focused at women's issues per se, but how can I serve what the ancients called the redemption and the sacred marriage of the masculine and feminine within each of us and between us? 
Well, my view of gender is very much informed by how it is, uh, first of all, valuing of difference versus equating difference, uh, starting with this fundamental difference in form in our species between men, you know, the male form and the female form with uh, superiority and inferiority with dominating and being dominated with being served and serving. Uh, that is a fundamental difference. Do you value the difference? Now, I look at the new findings about gender, and they are quite different from some of what we have assumed, which is that women are passive and men are active. Women can be very active and men can be passive. Um, and a lot of the struggle today, actually, between those pushing us back to more rigid domination times and those who want to create a better future revolves around gender stereotypes. So, for example, it isn't just women who are challenging the, quote, feminine as defining, you know, passivity, as defining uh, only receptivity, etc. But it is also men who are challenging the stereotype of the real men, you know, uh, real masculinity being equated with violence, uh, with domination. And this struggle is very real. I am in contact with many of the men working in the men's movement, for example. And the partnership frame really, uh, because we don't know. I mean, certainly there are biological differences between women and men. Uh, women, uh, women's bodies can give life, can nurture life, you know, the milk that we have, etc. But we absolutely don't know today how many of the Jungians, you know, archetypes are really cultural constructs out of a domination system. So my view is that both women and men I contain both uh, the capacity to be active and the capacity to be receptive, but that caring is no longer coded as feminine and hence something that men no longer, because, you know, how, how is masculinity defined in domination system? It's a very negative way. It's not being like a woman not being a sissy. And women enforce that. You know, they call caring men sissies, right? Mm -hmm. In domination systems. So this is not a question of women against men or men against women. It's a question of our intrinsic humanity. I, I agree. Both women and men. And I'm so glad to hear you say that because I think that what the future holds is a whole redefinition of what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man and an acceptance that there are people in between. That is, this is, yes, I mean, there are binaries in nature, hot, cold, et cetera, a dark light, but there are degrees and accepting that there are degrees also. So the movement towards gender binary is really, it, but but the problem is that somehow we have all been brought up really to think that there's scarcity, that we have to fight one at other. And here we have this battle, you know, between some of the non-binary people and the so-called cis people, which is a distraction. Mm -hmm. And it is, we've got to stop fighting one another. I mean, this is really so, so fundamental to change, but we've all inherited this. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think that ancient understanding that within each of us is all of that. And therefore, how do we authentically, within our own unique expression, 
you know, ex- express that and embody that in the world. Well, and it's happening. Yes, I mean, it is more, happening. I'm great. <laughs> more men are doing fathering the way we used to define only mothering, you know, diapering babies, doing the women's work of feeding babies, and more women are having careers, are taking leadership positions. But the resistance to this is fundamental to, I mean, look at what these people who are really, really pushing us back, whether it's here in the United States or Putin in Russia or Orban in Hungary, uh, they are very stuck in the old gender stereotypes. You know, in the old... I was going to point out, you know, that if you look at a map, if everybody just imagines a world map and you know the difference between this conversation, which is really kind of happening in the context of the United States and the European Union, if you look at Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia and look across all these cultures and refer them to Cornerstone 4 on story and language, you see that as we're trying to reach the threshold of being a global civilization that works for all, we're still stuck in this amazing struggle at the most fundamental level of how these two things called gender end up having all of these cultural implications, boundaries, and definitions. So expand on that a little bit more because isn't that again, connecting the conundrum of the science with then how that's dealt with culturally. Well, I'd like to say that the first thing, the first fundamental step is no longer thinking of gender as a, quote, women's issue or as a gender issue, but as a primary social and economic organizing principle. And we see that Uh, jumping to economics, and we'll do that later, in what I call the hidden system of gendered values, where there is always money for prisons, you know, the punitive male head of household, right? But somehow there isn't enough resource, enough money for nurturing children, for caring for children, for feeding children, what's coded as feminine, right? Uh, this uh, We have all, however, been brought up to think of gender as peripheral. And if you look at our conventional social categories, and this is really fundamental, they all either marginalize or just ignore or say that that's just how it is, uh, the ranking of male over female, but they ignore the the majority of humanity, women and children, and hence families. And as we're seeing all around us, and I'm so glad, Kurt, that you brought up uh, Afghanistan and the Saudis. I mean, authoritarian regimes rely on the ranking and the control in families and in society of what is coded as masculine over what is coded as feminine, uh, of men over women. And you see it in really stark relief in these very proto-authoritarian societies. I mean, we're talk talk about top-down rankings. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Taliban and the depriving of women of any chance to move. I mean... But, you know, we have inherited this. I mean, the Athenians would not, for all they're taught it, uh, you know, in my book, Sacred Pleasure, I have a chapter called The Reign of the Phallus, a drawing from a book by a wonderful, uh, wonderful, cool is her name. Um, um, Really, she is a classicist who wrote a book called The Reign of the Phallus, exposing the domination side of the ancient Athenian civilization. You know that uh, good women, right, were confined to the women's quarters, were deprived of education. I mean, only the hetarai, who were bad women, right, were permitted to have some education. Uh, I mean, it was a terrible mix of 
domination and partnership with really the structure of the society. Well, as Aristotle put it later, um, you know, slaves are meant to be slaves and women are meant to be dominated because they're born women and they're born slaves and that's it, period. And interesting and of enough- Both of you have written, and it's one of the specialties in, in Jude's, uh, Jude's PhD in archeology, span about earlier civilizations where they were far more balanced, far more egalitarian, both not only with regard to gender, but with regard to power and weapons and war. And yeah, make some comments on that because these are the new data sets also from science that are showing that it wasn't always just this way. So, yeah. Absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, uh, my PhD, Rianne, was in anthropological archeology. span So it was primarily focused on the transition, the great shift of of, uh, lifestyle and awareness between the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers and the Neolithic farmers and and pastoralists. And realizing I live in England and I live in a beautiful sacred landscape near uh, called Avebury, which is near Stonehenge. And if we go back um, to around 5,000 years ago here, there was a very egalitarian society. We find that the burial chambers have men and women and children. We find the artifacts that suggest that although there was a differentiation in roles, there was not a differentiation in in status, that there was very much communal and communal gatherings and that that recognition. Um, And so what I did was I also looked across the world for for other examples of that and, and was finding them. But the interesting thing was that around two and a half thousand BC, four and a half thousand years ago, we now realize from genetic studies that there was a major migrant, uh, migratory uh, route and, and, and transition from Central Europe that brought with it a dominant hierarchy, a male dominating hierarchy, to the extent that in, in here in England, uh, our indigenous masculine genetics went out within a gen generational two we literally find that that threshold where that indigenous balanced community were then bifurcated by these incomers which brought a much more dominant perspective in and and the other thing to perhaps mention to to come back at you with is um the the industrial revolution because of course it pretty much started here in the uk and i think that was another point another threshold of domination because we had the difference between producers which were primarily masculine or male and reproducers with reproducers being valued progressively less and less and the producers of of you know mechanical um society being raised in terms of this dominant culture so here we saw it we saw both a very early communality and balance and then we saw a, a really profound shift in the 17th and 18th century to an even, you know, to a to progressively more dominant culture. Well, you know, that's fascinating. I don't know if you know my books, The Chalice and the Blade and Sacred Pleasure, because the evidence that you found uh, is detailed. Yeah. I mean, our societies like Chatalhuyak, for example, where Ian Harder, the anthropologist who excavated there, uh, wrote in the Scientific American that gender, there was no sign, because we just talked about gender as an organizing principle, that there was no sign in this generally egalitarian society. Early farming, this is very interesting, because the early farming still maintained some of the traditions, like in Chatalhuyak, of the earlier, more partnership-oriented societies. See, I think that we need to understand that it was during periods of great disequilibrium that this change can happen. And you mentioned, um, I mean, to, to, to jump... Uh, And I really highly recommend, by the way, that you take a look at Sacred Pleasure because the Heroes Gamos, uh, it's about how sexuality and spirituality, the first part, is on how they were radically transformed uh, with the shift to a domination system. 
and it's fascinating. I mean, it's it, it's a lot of the research, as you know, it's like a Sherlock Holmes a detective sort of trying to put the clues that are all over the place and the missing clues at, together. But uh, to move to the Industrial Revolution, yes, it brought out more of the domination system. But as far as women were concerned, um, the evidence is very clear. The witch hunts, for example, the uh, women had no rights, children had no rights. And as an attorney, I know what the law was. And it was pretty, the English common law was pretty, you know, the husband and the wife are one and the one is the male. But the point I was going to make is that this time of disequilibrium not only brought out the domination uh, hierarchies in, 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 you know, in, in, in sharp relief, but it also was the beginning of one social, organized social movement after another, challenging the same thing, a tradition of domination. I mean, think about it. The so-called rights of man, the Enlightenment movement, challenged the so-called divinely ordained right of kings to rule their quote subjects. The feminist movement, which you know started in the 1700s, really uh, challenged again another divinely ordained right of men to rule over the women and children in the so-called castles of their homes. The abolitionist civil rights, and now, of course, the right Black Lives Matter movement, anti-colonial movements, challenged, again, the so-called divinely ordained right of a, quote, superior race to rule over inferior ones, all the way to the environmental movement today, challenging, uh, well, uh, man's once hallowed and idealized conquest and domination of nature. Now, this is only really possible in times of disequilibrium. And the fact that the struggle between movement towards partnership and movement back towards more rigid domination is really at, coming to a head right now is part of that disequilibrium of the shift from the industrial to the post-industrial knowledge service era. So we have an opportunity but it is also a time of enormous crisis and climate change, certainly. I mean, is Gaia saying to us, hey, yeah. you know, I mean, come on, exactly. <laughs> change or else. Exactly. Shift to partnership and harmony with nature rather than conquest or nature. But the problem, as I said, and I will stop with this, I spoke to the United Nations General Assembly on a session um, on harmony with nature, you can't just tack on harmony with nature to a fundamentally imbalanced system. And hence, these four really long-range fundamental cornerstones of the certainly, we started with story and language, and it's, they're all interconnected, of course. The stories about gender, I mean, our fairy tales, Cinderella, I mean, she can't you know, I mean, Sleeping Beauty can't even wake up unless a man kisses her, right? I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, learned helplessness yes. and dependence. It's, it's horrendous. But uh, gender and childhood have to be taken into account. Yeah, and with that, let's move then to that discussion of Cornerstone One, which is with regard to childhood. And I was just thinking as we're moving over to this, if uh, if an ET was chronicling the history of our planet, they would be saying, oh my God, they're still they're still working out these fundamental issues and not even getting close to what corresponds to what nature would teach them or cosmology would teach them. So let's take a look at Cornerstone One, which of course is childhood and especially relevant with the projects that both of you are working on with regard to children's books and these messages. So again, to start with Jude, what is new in the science that is casting new light and understanding on this crucial cornerstone about childhood that Rihanna has done so much important work to elaborate? Well, I think there are a number of things. I mean, we can we can take it very much into sort of the human dimension. 
but also from a cosmological perspective, whenever there is that resolution of the tensions between perceived dualities, which, you know, Rianne, you, you might refer to as, you know, the dominance is really an imbalance. And if we can come into the, 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 the balance and the congruence and the complementarity and the synergy, then in cosmological terms, something new emerges. And in universal wisdom teachings, that's often talked of as being the divine child. And of course, in the Vedic tradition of the, the inner masculine, feminine and, and child expressions of ourselves, it's when, you know, the journey to awareness comes to that congruent point when, you know, in Indian tradition, the Kundalini arises, enlightenment arises, self-awareness at the most profound level arises. So there's something happening, it seems to me, potentially at this time in our human journey, where if we can, with a unitive narrative, with this new perspective, an ancient perspective of, of a living and loving universe, a sentient universe, an evolutionary universe, find ways, as you say, of coming together, of healing both within ourselves and then coming together in the way that you so uh, wonderfully support and, 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 and share, then it seems to me that, you know, perhaps metaphorically, perhaps evolutionary, you know, there can be the birth of the divine child within our collective psyche. And that is expressed in, 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 in traditional terms as a time of co-creativity, a time of wonder a time of exploration, a time in a sense of remembering the wholeness of who we really are. So that's from that perspective. And then from a from a nurturing perspective, I think that is all part of this, a nurturing and education, you know, to, to bring forth what's within each and every one of us as children is, is just such a fundamental aspect of what we're sharing and, and exploring. Well, you know, uh, you make me think of so many things. One, the emergence of a new story of what is good child rearing, what is good parenting. And of course, we're having two conflicting narratives here. You know, one, you know, spare the rod, spoil the child. You know, it's the, it's the dominator way. You know, you traumatize the child, you rely on fear, uh, it's very highly punitive, etc. And the emerging one is a very different story. Yesterday, I spoke to a young woman uh, who has a two-year-old, and she's embracing this authoritative, uh, really uh, understanding that what children and all of us crave is caring connection, yes. and that that can be used to explain and to really, uh, rather than fear and, 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 and infliction of pain, you know, pleasure and pain are two very interesting differentiations between the sharing of pleasure. You see it among the bonobos, for example, which have a much more partnership-oriented social organization. They share food, share sex, uh, and the domination system. But uh, something uh, that I think that we have to pay attention to is that even our ancient wisdom traditions, to some extent, um, are, well, in, in Sacred Pleasure, I make the uh, suggestion that our mystical traditions are attempts to mystify the old teachings. Uh, and that's why they are so convoluted, you know, uh, because people were still trying to hang on to these old teachings, but already in the Shekinah or the Sophia, she's lower. But yeah, she's still very important, but she still is lower to the male god, right? Uh, it, it, we have to, um, I have always wanted to have a project of disentangling the core wisdom teachings of caring, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, uh, uh, compassion, uh, helpfulness, caring from the overlay of dominator teachings in our scriptures. And 
I think it is such an important project because otherwise you have people quoting the parts of our scriptures that are support and were meant to support domination systems. So that's another thing that you made me think about. So many <laughs> strains here. Thank you, Rianne. And I agree with you. I mean, the further back I go in, in all the work that I've done, that that overlay of domination just is 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 not it, it accretes over time. It's accreted over time. But the earliest writings of the Vedas, the Upanishads, I'm not seeing that per se. I'm not seeing it in a number of the indigenous teachings. But I agree with you. And what a fa fascinating project that would be. That would be wonderful to work on. Well, I, I would love to see you and others who are, have that curiosity and that tenacity uh, work with uh, leaders from all the major world religions who know that there is this mix. It's like an old painting where it has been painted over and yeah. it's our job to restore it. Exactly. Not to go back to any good old days, but to understand the patterns, the configurations in which gender and family. I, I also thought when you were talking of the um, sacred marriage, the first images, I think, are, are from Chatal Huyak, from what uh, Maria Gimbutas, the archaeologist, calls old Europe, uh, of a woman and a man, and then... Uh, together, you know, in the exactly. sacred marriage. And in Chantal Huyak, it's the woman and the man together. And then next to them, next to that frieze, is the woman holding a baby. So it's like a lesson in sex education. <laughs> but it's also the sacred marriage and the birthing of the divine child. That must be very ancient. It is. And I've actually been at... Um... At Chattel Huyik itself, but also I've been at the uh, the Turkish Museum, um, which actually recreates Chattel Huyik and the Lady of Animals as well as a, as a power center of, of, of all of this. So, as you say, that symbolism and that very clear way of, of, of uh, expressing that sacred marriage is very powerful. And, some, and also Maltese temples that I've been in as well. Oh, aren't they fascinating with these huge women? But you know, it's interesting because it was a figure in from Chantal Huyat of a woman giving birth, which, you know, when I grew up, you couldn't even teach school if you were pregnant, right? And here we have a figure of, of a divine figure, which was mislabeled, by the way, as being found in a trash bin. And now it turns out that it wasn't, that it was a mislabeling of where it was found, but of a female giving birth, a woman giving birth as part of the sacred iconography. And that blew my mind. I mean, because and for sacred pleasure too. I mean, how really, as I write in uh, The Chalice and the Blade, reality has been stood on its head. Well, it's being turned on its head again now, I think, with this emergent cosmology. It's been healed, I hope. I yeah, hope so. In, uh, in your book, Nurturing Our Humanity, uh, Rian, you know, you not you relate both to the issue of how children are reared and then, in that sense, how cultures are reared. And it's interesting in the projects that you're both involved now with children's books. I know, Rian, you've mentioned what are the images that we've seen when we were children, that made us think it's always been this way. And the one you've always said, which I saw as a child, was the caveman with a club in one hand and dragging a woman by the hair in the, in the other hand. And we've seen that from the time we were children. And so the whole thing of how the four cornerstones, you know, blend together in, in trying to sort out this quagmire of how we've ended up in that sense you know, making these really pathological decisions of how how uh, cultures are really structured. And so that actually leads us, because we really have about 10 minutes left here, we're both all busy people, to bring us to that cornerstone on economics, which really is where it gets all embedded in how a, a culture maintains these dominance hierarchies in ways that are then 
very, very difficult to transform. So Jude, you know, one of the things in your biography is also having been a major figure in economics and business and still today in a number of major initiatives. So I want to ask you, what are you seeing and what are the initiatives that you're a part of that are now affecting this crucial cornerstone with regard to economics? Thank you, Kurt. Absolutely. Rihanna, I don't know if you know, but I used to, to run two $500 million businesses in 36 countries. So I do know the pathology very, very well. Um, and that, I think, has stood me in good stead in terms of hopefully being able to serve something of how we might transform for the better. And it it really comes back to the, the cornerstone of the story and the and the new ancient story of wholeness and unity and, and the unitive narrative that can underpin and frame potential transformational change. And with education and economics being two absolutely vital interwoven aspects of that, Kurt, as, as you said. So for me, what I'm involved with on the economic side is to see whether there may be a, a route, because I don't honestly see, you know, in one step you're free. I do see it as a journey of, of, of transition and transformation from the pathology and the pathological economics and, and financial system we've had um, to what might be, but also recognizing that, you know, there have been some good ideas along the way. They've just been misinterpreted, mishandled, you know, and mainly from the domination perspective have become the pathology that they are today. So what I'm doing is I'm working with a, a group of leading economists, primarily who have been involved in the regenerative regenerative agriculture, regenerative um, uh, uh, approaches, but to see whether we can take that even further. So what I'm really sensing this is, is a sort of a dance between process of change and changing worldview, and the two sort of work together. So the more we behave from a whole worldview, the more we will have a whole worldview. The more we have a whole worldview, the more we will behave from a whole worldview in that regard. So I'm talking about a, a process of resetting, reforming, regenerating, and transforming all to a unitive economics. And for me, the definition of unitive economics is it's the natural principles that emerge from a living and loving universe and a living and loving planetary home. So it is about healing our relationships with Gaia, each other and Gaia. It's much more from that non-dominant, cooperative, synergistic, co-creative ways that your work is so wonderfully important, Rianne. Um, But it's a process because I, I personally can't see that we can go from, it's like a healing process. It's like a healing journey. But in each step, it's recognizing the, the closer alignment with this unitive perspective and, and, and an underpinned an underpinning of a unitive narrative. But I think we can get there. And I've, I'm working with people like John Fullerton and others um, and Rick Clugston of the Earth Charter and, and others. Um, and it feels a time, one of the things that I was aware of, you may have heard this too, both of you, is that the recent high level political forum at the United Nations was absolutely pervaded by a call for for, trans, for change in economics, realizing that without that change, that's like the first domino to fall. And if that can start to change, then so much else can come into alignment. Well, I, there's so much um, of a commonality in our goals here. We at the Center for Partnership Systems uh, have developed, first of all, a, an, a measure of uh, to assess where are we uh, on this domination partnership scale, focusing on the four cornerstones. And I'd love to share that with you. But the project that I am really looking for partners in is to develop a new metric, because as wonderful as Fullerton and uh, Rowalls, et cetera, are, they do not pay enough attention to gender, to family, and to frankly, narrative and story uh, informed by those. And I think that we need new metrics that mm -hmm. show the economic value of the work of caring for people starting at birth 
and caring for our natural life support systems. There are lots of metrics in the works, but the, none of them, they it's like the S SDGs, you know? I mean, somewhere among them in the mix is gender and somewhere among them is, you know, uh, 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 taking care of children. But no, these are primary. And if you look at the people pushing us back and the rhetoric that is being used to get them to move back and to and the disinformation story, I mean, it is focused on the four cornerstones, identified with those on top as the job creators, regardless of the injustice of having CEOs earn, what is it, 300 times? what somebody can earn in a lifetime, for goodness sakes. I mean, that is domination economics, and it isn't capitalism. I mean, it, we could have different charters, but I'd love to talk with you about this, uh, developing more of an awareness, uh, in especially in the metrics of what should be the goal of economics. I wrote a book called The Real wealth of nations you know it's a play on smith of course the, the wealth of nations uh i i really urge you to take a look at it i, it I came have, out. It. I have, oh, it's, have it. it's wonderful i would love us to continue this conversation and I let's hope. continue the conversation jude because uh i mean fullerton is wonderful but i think that to 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 him and even to rowers, you know, a woman, gender, childhood, they're somewhere in the mix, but they're not central. And they maybe, really are. Maybe we can help that change. I maybe would love together, to. We can help that change. I would love to help that change. And if you if you can let's work together on this because we have to develop new metrics. I agree. If we're going, I mean, I, I, you know, I moved in my writing from how did we get to this place, you know, chalice, and, but then I started to think, well, what do we need to do exactly to make the change? Exactly, exactly. That's where we are now, and um, it's been an absolute pleasure, by the way. Oh, to, yeah, no, I agree. I'm definitely going to set a time to continue this conversation and also to refer our listeners to the wonderful discussion in this series that Rian had with, with Steve Farrell, who's one of the big voices in conscious business. So I really refer you to that. But I look forward to another discussion where we can go into all of these deeper. So we really have about five minutes left before we have other appointments to make. I want to give each of you half of that to uh, to kind of do a summary here on on this relationship of the four cornerstones and everything that you've talked about in this uh, 50 some minutes we've had together. Rianne, would you like to go first or would you like me to? Either way, why don't you go first since uh, it's fine. Well, first of all, just to repeat my gratitude to you, Rianne, for, you know, articulating the four cornerstones, which I wholeheartedly agree with are, as I said, the ashlars, they're the foundations for transformational change. And what I'm delighted by is that you did include narrative and story there, because we are a we are a story sharing species. The stories we tell are the stories we live by, and we have lived progressively with this this dysfunctional um, story of domination and and all that it's brought into the world. And you know, without sort of blaming and shaming it, enough already. <laughs> <laughs> enough already so what I'm also aware of is that two and a half thousand years ago a whole sort of evolutionary impulse sort of flowed through our collective psyche which is sometimes called the axial age and it seems to me that we are now on the potential of the threshold of a unitive age where we can heal this dis-ease of separation where we can come together and co-create transformational change in the world. And we can only do it together. And I realize and appreciate there's a lot of folks out there who perhaps don't want that to happen. But I'm a great, I have great trust in, in the evolutionary impulse of our universe. And I feel we're being invited now to, to sort of, as, as Ken Wilber says, wake up 
um, you know, grow up, clean up because of the trauma and show up. And, and I like to add and link up and lift up together. And that's why I'm so grateful <laughs> for, our, for our conversation today and the beginning of what I hope will be our being able to work together in these ways to serve the good of the whole. So thank you. And thank you, Kurt, for inviting us and sharing in all of this and the wonderful work you do. Yeah, no, it's absolutely great that this collaboratory is bringing together so many voices now across all of these areas of engagement. So, Rian, you can wind us up and, uh, and well, still make your next appointment. Well, I um, am in a sense speechless, but in another sense, um, I always uh, come back. We've got to work together and to work together. The people pushing us back have a unified frame. It's the domination model, whether it's Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or Orban or Putin or Trump. It doesn't matter. It's the same top down, starting in family, starting with gender. Uh, it's there. Um, whereas we are all over the map. You know, the environmental movement is here and the uh, movement towards uh gender justice is there and reproductive freedom is still over here and uh, a child, you know, changing how we parent is over there. Uh, we've got to come together and to come together, we need a frame. And at this point, I think that uh, we really need to focus on the fundamentals, not to give up anything that we're doing but to also realize that gender and childhood and family, uh, that these are not just children's issues and women's issues. They're central mm -hmm. to what kind of a world we create and co-create. So um, I uh, am very happy to have done this with both of you. And I thank you, Kurt, for bringing us together. and. Um, onward. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So thank you very much, Dr. Rian Eisler and Dr. Jude Kuravan. Thank you so much for joining us in these video discussions of the Synergy Circles Collaboratory of the Evolutionary Leaders, a project of the Source of Synergy Foundation. In this collaboratory, 23 activist circles across diverse areas of activist engagement bring you important discussions on the topics portrayed in the banners of this series and the discussions that you have just heard from prominent global thought leaders. So crucially needed if our world is to move from dominance consciousness and dominance cultures to partnership consciousness and partnership cultures. You can learn more at evolutionaryleaders.net slash synergy circles where you'll find out more also about our Igniting the Holo Movement. That's H-O-L-O movement.net. And then all the other links that follow in the credits directly hereafter. Thank you for joining us in this era of emerging networks of networks so desperately needed for our achievement of a world that works for all. Music